Uh, hi, Odette Pearson. I'm at Samri. Um, I'm a senior research fellow there with <coughs> Professor Alex Brown. What my um, question is today is really about. Um, so you've, you know, you're, you're aware of all of the, the health um, and social issues relating to Aboriginal, the Aboriginal population here in South Australia, and um, as well as um, how complex the the situation is in um, trying to address it. I believe um, that South Australia has an opportunity to lead the way in improving Aboriginal health outcomes and reducing life expectancy. And I believe that for several reasons. There's the will. Um, there, there's some great work being done here. There's leaders as well. And we're getting a better understanding at a small area level of what the health issues are, because there is variation across the population. So my question really is um, how, how do you see prioritising pretty much everything? Everything is a priority. So how um, in, you know, in sort of four years time, like where do you really want to be with Aboriginal health and how will you go about prioritising um, the things that we need to be working on over, the, over your term? Yep, thanks, Oda. It's a really good question because there are competing priorities and there are, um, there are competing, competing jurisdictions as well. So I think a priority for us is understanding, you know, what are the responsibilities of the federal government, what are the responsibilities of the state government and how they can actually work and interact better. Um, I don't think that this has been um, something that has really um, uh, been working as well as it possibly could in the past. A classic example is um, remote renal dialysis where the federal government had one agenda, uh, the South Australian government had a, a separate agenda. There was a, a study done for Central Australia renal dialysis, it was published five years ago. We basically ignored the findings of that. We've got to understand that we are part of a much larger system and by working together and setting uh, priorities together we can uh, perform uh, better. As I sort of said, from my perspective, there's two key things that initially sort of jump out at me and that is that we need to be making more informed decisions based upon data, based upon evidence, uh, rather than just based upon gut feel. And the second thing is we need to get a much higher proportion of Aboriginal health workers into the system uh, who are, are, are part of the solution, uh, rather than uh, a group of very well-meaning people saying, this is the solution uh, for you. So um, that will be, uh, they will be two key priority areas. But look, we are, I think, 64 days into the new government. And uh, so I think it's fair enough that we haven't been able to you know, fully articulate all of the uh, priorities in this area, but evidence-based and involving um, Aboriginal people in the solutions are going to be critical areas for us. I'm Herb Mack, I work for the Aboriginal Health Directorate for Country Health SA. Approximately half of the uh, Aboriginal population live in rural and remote um, South Australia. The problem we have is uh, we have less I don't think the government <coughs> understands uh, about the infrastructure in those rural and remote communities, especially for Aboriginal people. So we start developing, um, SA Health and, and Country Health and, and the uh, federal government, develop policies and strategies uh, that we have to fit into. So we, we don't have um, anything that's built specifically for South Australian country um, Aboriginal people. So how are, we, how are we going to get more? We are on the lowest rung of all of those health determinants. So how do we get us off the, that lowest rung? Uh, you named some of those health determinants. How are we going to go about fixing them? Especially for the more remote and rural communities. And we, we have a big problem with that. We also have a problem with... Um, self-discharge for Aboriginal people when they come into our, our larger hospitals uh, and that's because there is um, a lack of cultural respect, cultural knowledge, cultural empathy, all of that type of stuff. We are currently working with um, uh, Women's and Children's Hospital and trying to um, organise that for right across SA Health but it's a very, very slow process and I feel personally that it is not a high priority. And as um, this young lady said before, all of this stuff should be high, uh, high priority, uh, but especially for the more remote and um, Aboriginal communities. Mm. 
Well, certainly, um, I don't want to in any way sort of uh, come across as an expert in this area, but um, you, my understanding was that there were quite a lot of um, Aboriginal-led, you know, uh, health facilities in uh, regional or remote South Australia. I suppose the issue for us is trying to understand what the, the best, the optimal model of care is between, you know, organisations like Nanapa Health and uh, Country Health SA. So, you know, you know you, it's a balancing act between um, uh, that, that provision uh, of um, dedicated specialists, um, uh, Aboriginal-led uh, health organisations, and then the um, just the recognition, I suppose, that we can't provide every service in every single community, so you need to have some centralised services which are mainstream. And understanding <coughs> that interface is, I think, you know, going to be uh, critical. I think the other, uh, you know, key issue for us, and again, going back to the data, is going to be about trying to develop preventative uh, programs and a much greater pro uh, focus on preventative programs. In the lead up to the election, we were really impressed. Uh, by the number of groups that came along and spoke to us about their interest in trying to get ahead of the game. So instead of waiting till you know, people reach an acute setting in a major teaching hospital in metropolitan Adelaide, we thought about, well, how can we actually get ahead of that game uh, by a couple of years, uh, by uh, a much greater focus on preventative um, medicine so, uh, and approach and education. And although there are a lot of those programs, I'm not convinced uh, for one second that there's been you know, a comprehensive evaluation of the efficacy of those programs. So whilst we've looked really busy doing things, I think that you know, we have an opportunity now to say, well, what are the programs uh, which are working well and how can we resource them adequately? And what are the programs that aren't and can they be reoriented? Because I think, again, <clears throat> in this area, uh, there are a lot of, um, I mean, I don't want to criticise anybody's application in this area. Uh, everybody has the right aspiration but if we're not achieving uh, outcomes, then we really need to go back because we have got an obligation uh, to improve the outcomes, not just be busy, but focus on outcomes, not just inputs, and that will be uh, a focus for us. We, we genuinely want to improve the outcomes in regional and remote um, South Australia where the, the situation is far more complicated than what it would be in metropolitan area. Uh, it, it's not a simple process, and I don't want to say that we've been elected uh, we're up to day 64 or whatever it is, and we're going to solve all of the problems by day 70. We're going to have to work together. We're going to have to prioritise. We've got to understand that, that balance between the federal and the state systems, um, you know, dedicated services and mainstream uh, state services, and that uh, inter interface between acute uh, settings and preventative programs. Um, we also spoke to my, myself and my colleague, Theresa, spoke to about 180-odd youth um, over the last... Um, just over 12 months. Um, we have a, we should, well, from my point of view, we should be looking at preventative measures yes. to stop them getting into trouble. So a lot of the stuff that they talked about were those social determinants and they, they were also talking about the justice system, employment, housing, um, all of that type of stuff. Um, even for places like uh, Port Lincoln, which I found a little bit, I was a little bit dumbfounded by, but they need work. Uh, Aboriginal youth need work. They need pathways to, uh, to lead a better life. Um, and, and I think we should be looking at some of those pathways for, the, for our youth. Because over half of uh, our uh, Aboriginal people that live in the country are uh, under age 25. Mm. So we should be concentrating on them. Yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with any of that. I think you're exactly right. And we've got to always understand when we're dealing with issues regarding health that they sit into a bigger uh, system. And you're quite right, you know, employment, education, you know, uh, there, are, there are a lot of determinants uh, that we need to be taking into consideration. As I said at the outset, this is, I think, the most complicated area of public policy. And I must say, when I was, um, <coughs> when I was forming the ministry, people were strongly advising me against taking this portfolio because they said it is very complicated and there are very few wins. Uh, and I said, well, that's exactly and precisely why I want to take this portfolio, because I think that, um, you know, I've only been in Parliament for eight years and I think we've had six ministers in that time and it has never been really given um, the, uh, the level of importance. Uh, and I don't want to be critical because some of those ministers I think were excellent and I enjoyed working with them. Um, but I just think it, from a structural perspective, if the Premier has the portfolio, then we're in a much better position to be able to say, well, what are our outcomes going to be in health? 
what are our outcomes going to be in education and corrections and law and order and domestic violence and, and jobs, as you quite rightly point out. Whereas I think that when you've got a, a cabinet minister equal with the other ministers, the other ministers have always got their priorities and their stresses and having a minister saying, but what are you doing in this area for Aboriginal people? I'm not saying they would ignore it, but it's not their key priority. Whereas if we can develop a whole of government approach, I think we're going to be able to make um, advances right across the board because they are all connected and we can't just look at you know, health outcomes by themselves. Um, my name's Kim Morey and I'm from the South Australian Aboriginal Chronic Disease Consortium, which yes. is a part of the Translation Centre um, based in Samory. Um, my question is, I didn't hear any mention in you, when you spoke about the stolen generation and um, often the stolen generation are members of our community that don't have a voice and so um, I'm just wondering what is the position from your perspective about the um, stolen generation in South Australia because I think there's some unfinished business um, that's a hangover from the previous government but is important and has a big impact on the health and wellbeing of our community. Um, you know, the stolen generation and their descendants. So I'm just wondering what would your position be on that? Well, again, I don't want to sort of present myself as any expert in this area, but um, I mean, it was actually the Liberal Party. I actually moved the legislation for the stolen generations compensation scheme in South Australia because we'd been talking about it for a very long period of time. Tasmania had gone in and, and, and dealt with it very quickly. It took, the process took way too long. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, um, the reason why we were arguing uh, for this some time ago, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I think it must be at least four years ago, uh, was that we do need to deal with this issue. Uh, and um, I'd be interested in any perspectives as to um, how people feel after the process, because the former government told me that we didn't need to just do this quickly. We needed to take the time. People needed to have the opportunity to uh, tell their story and have that recorded uh, and that this was an important part of the healing process and so we were supportive of that but we did say that there could be two streams you know ones that, that could be paid earlier and, and other people that wanted to tell their stories because a lot of people said to me we don't want to tell our stories some people will find it very therapeutic and healing and part of um, capturing um, stories that will be there forever other people don't and I think that um, we just need to be respectful of that, but look, I'm we're, we are in this area. We're not opinionated, and uh, we, we don't say that we've got all the knowledge. So, if there are things that you think that we should be doing, then I'd be very, very pleased to hear. Thank you, um, Tamara McKean from Southgate Institute and George Institute. I have two questions yes. relating to some of the existing comments and stuff that you've already said, Premier, around structural changes yes. and capacity building. Yes. I'm very interested in understanding beyond what you've done in terms of taking the portfolio yourself, what will be the structural mechanisms amongst your ministers and your the bureaucracy to ensure that there is that effective cross-sectoral collaboration in order to realise changes in the social determinants of Indigenous health and related to that alongside those structural changes, what sort of capacity building amongst the people involved in those decision making processes will need to happen in order for there to be that effective collaboration? Yeah. Well, it's still early days, so at the moment what we're trying to do is to just get a picture of what um, programs are currently being offered within individual departments, because again, it just seems to me there's a lot of disparate work uh, being done. V virtually every government department has got you know, some programs which are in place, but they're not well understood by the entire cabinet. Um, one of the differences, and this is a little bit boring and a little bit technical, but one of the differences between uh, our government and previous governments, um, not just in South Australia but around the country, is that we want to run a cabinet government. So, in other words, the cabinet minister just doesn't come to the table arguing about their part of the pie, but really making decisions as an entire group um, on a consensus basis. So, uh, you know, this is you know, one of the methodologies that we're using. And so in the first instance in this, we're trying to get an understanding of what individual departments are doing. So we've spoken to chief executives uh, about that. Then to look at what programs are working and w w you know, where are the ideas for further investment in those existing programs. But very soon we're going to have to work out our mechanism for going out to the community to get their buy-in. I suppose I would just make this point that um, Sometimes we spend you know, three years determining a governance structure 
uh, for something uh, and then we go and implement it. And so sort of changes are taking a very long period of time. You know, a classic example was the governance arrangements on the APY lands. I mean, I think that that report took a couple of years and then it sat with the government for a, a year or so and then finally they went around and to change it. We're only just seeing, um, you know, the implementation of those um, recommendations now. I don't want to take that time. And I just need people to sort of say, look, you know, he might stuff up a few things, but at least he's moving. So my gut feeling is what we should be doing, and again, hasn't been finalised yet, but that we should actually set very short time horizons for what we um, do so we can get something out sooner rather than later and we can be working towards that, we can report, but then we can be working on the second iteration, the third iteration, the fourth iteration concurrently so that we don't have to sort of you know, only have one plan that we lock in for the next five years or ten years, but that we're actually, um, we're, we're actually delivering. So, uh, you know, it's not fully, uh, you know, resolved, but there will definitely be community consultation. But I don't want to sort of indicate that that community consultation will be a, a two or three year uh, process. We're just trying to work out what it's going to be so that it can get some, some action uh, something happening straight away as soon as possible and then we will immediately look to how we move to the next iteration. Does that make sense? Thank you. Sally Clark, I work for PwC Indigenous Consulting and you know 71 employees out of 14,600 um, I think it's it's very similar in all the professions so if we can get more Aboriginal people working and leading the programs and involved in all of our programs, we will get better outcomes. Um, and, you know, we find this everywhere um, in doing consulting work and, and um, you know, analysing programs. So, um, yeah, more Aboriginal people in the workforce will get better outcomes. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, look, 100% agree. That's exactly what we need to do. And I suppose from our perspective, what we need to understand is what the barriers are for getting more people into those jobs. Um, certainly in some areas, um, and it's just, it's not the medical uh, area, uh, but in, in, in some areas of government, there are positions available. They're not being, they're, they're qualified people and they're not being full, uh, filled. I don't know what it is in the health sector, what the constraints are, but we really need to understand what those constraints are and, and deal with them because we know that we'll have better outcomes. Jackie Arkit, Women's and Children's Health Network. I'm pleased to hear you say that um, you're going to sit up and take notice about what evidence we have in, in this state, in this country. 10, 20 years ago we had good evidence. Today we got even better evidence to tell you what you shouldn't do. Um, public policy. Um, I heard you say complex and complicated and those issues for our people are complex and it does look like it's complicated. But um, in terms of public policy, the first thousand days or whatever, I don't want to get into the politics of what we call it, but those early years, that good start in life, those <coughs> developmental years, they're the most important years for our children if we're talking about getting in front and getting mm. on the right foot. Um, we just need a policy that tells our services that it's important because we don't need new money. Those women are gonna birth at them hospitals anyway. So we just need them to shift that money into Aboriginal family birthing programs where we got good, good services, good quality services, culturally safe services delivered to our women so that our children get the best start in life. Mm. We don't need no new money, we just need people to move that money because we, 900 women, 900 children, Aboriginal children born every year mm. in this state and we could be given those children the best start in life. Yeah, no, spot on. I think that's um, just, you know, as I said, there's a lot of money which goes into health. It's our biggest area of expenditure. There's a lot of money that goes into Aboriginal affairs at the, at the federal level. It's about coordination and making sure that we can sort of listen to the evidence and, and make sure that we're making better decisions. Thank you, Premier, for um, addressing us and being and taking questions. Um, before I say anything else, I certainly support the workforce issue and was delighted when you highlighted that that was uh, uh, one that came to your mind pretty quickly. Um, 
As part of this council and working in cooperation with SAMRI and its uh, various uh, parts, I'm interested uh, to take up uh, your candid review in saying, well, we don't know all the answers. And whenever I hear that, I, I feel really like we're going to get somewhere because there's a process that needs to be embarked on to get there. And I'm interested in sustainable conversations and contributions on an ongoing basis. We'd be delighted for you to come back in six months' time, but what happens in between and what, what can we do together? And I'm just asking you if you could think about nominating somebody that the Council and SAMRI and can, can work up a program uh, so that we don't lose momentum and that the process and outcomes can be influenced by good conversations. I'll just go back and give one example where, where I think this group made a really significant contribution and it relates to reforms in clinical programs in health in which this group I thought would have uh, savaged the clinicians who came and said, I don't know what the problem is, we treat everyone the same. And, and, of course, that sort of comment uh, ignores all of the work up to a, a um, procedure or operation and also ignores what happens at discharge. People uh, can't be treated the same. They, everyone has special needs. And this group was very gentle with clinical staff when they, they could have well been savaged um, about building in better understanding of what it means to, to come to a hospital to have a procedure and then to be discharged with poor plans. And, and I think that was a contribution and it's something that, that... This is a wonderful group. It's a group that wants to problem solve. It's a group that wants to be involved. It's a group that doesn't just want to have a shot and, and be critical. And I, and I again restate my question is, can you please think about nominating somebody that you can um, work with and that we can work with on developing a process for ongoing um, involvement and ongoing influence. Mm. Is that unreasonable no. or, or is that something that you would, would think about? I'll take it on notice and not ask. No, I don't need to take it on notice. No. Um, don't know who to ask. Um, <laughs> I'm more than happy to commit to that. I think it's a really good suggestion, a practical suggestion. I think that's... Um, what we need to be doing is, I think, you know, anybody that thinks that they're an expert in an area like this, you know, you want to avoid them like the plague, quite frankly. Um, so having a group like this that we can have somebody from the health department and from the premier's department uh, getting involved with to tap into the collective knowledge, I'm sure we'll come up with much better solutions, practical solutions and things which will build capacity, uh, apply a preventative approach, talk about some of the practical things that you've uh, talked about like, you know, what do we do post-release? You know, how do we actually make sure that we're not just dealing with somebody on an individual basis and then back again three or six months later? Um, so, look, I'm really delighted to be here this morning. I'll certainly, if I can come to the next one, if you invite me along. Uh, if I haven't gone to it over time, then I would love to come along. But in the meantime, let's not just, you know, pencil it in in six months' time. Let's work over the next six months so that when we come back, we can report on some practical things that we're looking at together. Thanks for your time today and thanks for all of your work.